you're not gonna die. And you're not gonna die. disappointed in men wants to die there's a lot of things in life that are uncertain there's certainly a lot of things that are uncertain we make plans about a lot of things and they don't work out the way you plan them they certainly don't you anticipate certain things to happen they don't happen the way you anticipate them sometimes experience can in the past can prove to be wrong in the future it doesn't happen the way you thought it was going to happen but there's one thing you can be certain of this morning you can be absolutely and completely certain of this, that you're going to die. That is the most certain thing that a human being can know. And I want to emphasize that point to you this morning. It is absolutely, completely certain that you're going to die. A lot of people have the idea that, they, that the earth and life is just one big party. 24-7, that's what you're here for. You're here to party. You're here to have a big time. And then when, it, kind of when life's over, then you lay down in bed and gather your feet up and pull the covers up over you and say, well, goodbye world, it's over now, see you later. And that's it, but it doesn't happen that way. Life is not like that. You don't know how you're gonna come down to your end. You may get sick and languish for a long time, but you may walk out that back door and drop in that parking lot. You may pull out here on Woodrow Drive and something happens, some mishap, so anything can happen, we don't know. It is uncertain at how it's gonna happen. But there's one thing for certain, you're gonna die. Yeah. And the absolute most certain thing on the face of this earth is the fact that you will come to the end of your life and it is the very thing that very few people make any provision for whatsoever. You've worked for 30, 40 years for some company and all that and, and then the day of your retirement, you drop dead. You drop dead. You see, retirement is not absolute, it's not certain. It is not certain that you'll ever retire. It's not. It is not. It is not certain that you'll retire. But it is certain that you'll die. Yeah. It is absolutely, completely certain that the day is going to come when your life is going to end on this earth. Have you made preparation? Have you made preparation? Have you prepared yourself for that day? For it is coming. It is coming. And there's not one thing you can do to stop it. That day is coming. Are you ready? You say, well now, preacher, I just don't want to think about it. Not thinking about it is not going to change anything. Denying it is not going to change it. Saying it's not going to happen except for some long time off into the future. That's not so. Teenagers die. Young people die. Kids die. People die in their midlife. They die at all ages. Death is no respecter of age. I've been at a point in my life where I thought I might die. What'd you do, preacher? Did you think about your religion? I didn't give it five seconds. Amen. What about the people that you didn't even bother? What about this? I, none of it. Just the name of Jesus. I grabbed it. I latched on to the name of Jesus. That's the only comfort there is of this world. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you really take hold of him and he becomes a comfort to you, that reminds you and reassures you in your soul that you're a real believer. Yes! Did you hear what I said? When you're down and flat and it's out and you're out at the count, it's the one you're calling out to and take hold of and get comfort from. That's the one you believe in. Some of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Your comfort is in a prayer you prayed. Your comfort is in a catechism that you were uh, approved by. Your comfort is in your church. And there is no comfort in that hour but in one man, Christ Jesus the Lord. And he does give comfort. He does give comfort. He does give assurance. Do you believe? <laughs> yes, I believe. You better believe I do. Oh, yeah, I believe. I believe he's If I didn't believe he was alive, I'd close my book up and go get drunk. <laughs> Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you die. Nothing to live for. Yeah, he's alive. He lives, he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's way. He lives, he said. And he said, because I live, ye shall live also. 
In Revelation 1, he said, I am the living one. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, he said, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and hell. His life gives him authority. Not only is he worthy, but because he lives, he has authority to open and shut. I open, no man shuts. I shut, no man opens. And all judgment is given to me. Bless his holy name. Folks, it's about the Lord Jesus. This is all about the Son of God. Now, a lot of folks are so tied up with their life. They're so concerned about daily affairs and this and that, all the mechanics, the nuts and bolts, and everything that they're doing, the shopping trips, and the vacations, and all this stuff. And that's all they think about is this present evil world. And the Apostle Peter said, that's not going to do any good either. He said, you better start looking afar off. You better start looking to the future. You better start looking to where you're going. You better start thinking about your eternity. Unless you are a dog or a cat, unless you're a hog lying somewhere with a slop trough and you're satisfied just to eat and breathe, you should be thinking. You should be concerned about where you came from and where you're going. God made you a lot higher than the animals. He gave you a brain. He gave you the thought of eternity in your soul. Eternity, my friend, is either a glory for you or it's hell, fire, and damnation. Eternity is either a day when the gates open. And as Dwight Hell Moody said as he was leaving his body, he said to those around him, he said, is this it? Is this what I've been waiting for? Hallelujah! Yeah. And he left, and his body fell back to the bed. That's the way to leave. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. The Bible said it's appointed a man once to die, and then the judgment. We're all coming to that point. Every one of us are going to come to the time, if the Lord Jesus doesn't come back soon, when we cross over Jordan, when we leave this world and go to that world. Does it scare you to death? Do you shiver at night? Do you think? Is it a hard thought about where you're going? Do you are not certain about your eternity? What if you're going to die? Are you going to die? Are you going to, are you going to go to hell? Do you not know? The apostle Peter here in Peter talks about a mist. He talks about God reserving and preserving those that are going off to a mist of darkness forever. Have you ever heard anybody screaming as they're going to hell? Have you ever heard anybody as they begged God and there was no forgiveness for them? A lot of people pray, but they don't understand that if the Holy Ghost hasn't convicted you and brought you to repentance, everybody's like Pharaoh. Everybody can pray a sinner's prayer, but a sinner's prayer does not get you saved. The only thing thing that can get you saved is the grace of God received when he comes to you. And he could come to you right now. He could come to you any time. I had a man look at me one time years ago and he said, now preacher, he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to have a big time. I'm going to party. And he said, then when I get ready to die, he said, then I'll ask God to save me. And he said, therefore, I get the best of both worlds. I get everything this world has to offer. And then when I get ready to die, I'm just going to say, Jesus, I want to go to heaven, come into my heart, and I'm going to leave here and I'm going to glory. What a fool, my friend. What a fool. What a fool. It's so sad, but people believe that. I've had people saying, I preacher, you enjoyed your sin. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to get everything I can out of life. And then when it comes time for me to die, I'll get right with God. Like the choice is in your hands to choose the moment and the place. Like you are the Lord God Almighty of your life and you're not. The Bible said today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. Your today may be today. Your today may be tomorrow. You stand up, you say to me, preacher, I don't believe in hell. What do you base that on? Your feelings? Well, I'm going to tell you right now that I am not going to base my eternity on how you feel. Somebody can come to me and say, preacher, there is no hell. Tell me something, dear friend. How did you discover that? Have you been over there? If you're living a godless life and you're an atheist or an agnostic Christ rejecter, you can be certain of this. The day will come when you will discover firsthand that there is a hell. And when that day comes, there's nothing you can do about it because you're going to be there. You're going to leave this world without God and without Christ, and you go to hell. What do you think the cross is for? Why do you think we preach the blood? Why were we singing about Calvary this morning? Why were we singing about being saved? Because, my friend, that there is a place that you don't want to go to. People live like there is no judgment. They live like there is no hereafter. They live like they'll never give an account for their sins. They murder today like it's nothing. I have never seen in my life as many murderers walking around as we have today. They just blow each other away like it's no big deal. But the Bible says the murderer will have his place in hell. 
We've come to a point in our culture, in our society, where we are amoral, not immoral. Immoral is an individual that knows there's a morality. An amoral individual says there is no morality. I live as I please like a dog, and that's exactly the way people are living. We've gotten to the point now where it's just simply passe. It doesn't matter anymore. There's no meaning to anything. Whatever you feel good about doing, do it. For there is no fear of God in their eyes. Nobody fears God anymore. And I marvel at how people live godless, wicked lives, self selfish lives, and are shocked when something happens. I marvel at how deceived people can be to think that you can live like hell itself and then expect God just to sit back and approve of the kind of life you live. Sin and Satan will keep you in this la-la land where you think that you're just going to live forever and you can just live any way you please and life is just one big sinning party and then when you get ready somewhere way off in the future, then you're just going to leave out of a big party. My friend, you're going to die. You're going to die. It's appointed a man wants to die. Death is coming. Some of you, it's closer than you think. Some of you may be dead before the year's out. Some of you may be dead before the week's out. Some of you may be dead before the sun goes down. You do not know when it's coming. But I want to warn you again. Death is coming. It is certain. It is sure. It is the most certain thing there is on the face of this earth. The government can't change it. Education can't change it. Money can't change it. Associations can't change it. Your religion can't change it. Nothing can alter the fact that you're going to die. Are you ready? I know you prepared your house. I know you prepared your income. I know you prepared your marriage, your children. You planned out your whole life. But you've made no plans whatsoever for where you're headed when you leave this world. Hell is a place. It is a place that existed before you were ever born. It is there. It's going to be there. And there's nothing you can do to change that one bit whatsoever. It doesn't make any difference if the churches today have stopped preaching on hell. If the preachers don't preach on hell. If the seminaries and Bible colleges don't teach the young men about hell. If they extricate it from the Bible and make no difference whatsoever. It is still a place that you must deal with one day. Somebody, my friend, died this morning and they went to hell. Somebody took their last breath this day. They drew their last breath and awakened in hell. What a shock it must have been. There is no salvation in hell. There's no Savior in hell. There's no Bible in hell. There's no blood in hell. There's no altars in hell. There's no forgiveness in hell. Whatever goes to hell stays in hell. It's permanent. It's settled. It's settled. It's over with. What you've done in this life is what determines where you go. When you die without God, you go to hell. That's why Jesus came 2,000 years ago. That's why he died at the cross at Calvary. He didn't die to make you rich. He didn't die because of who you are. He didn't die to create this hell hole you know about. He died to keep you out of hell. That's why he went to the cross. That's why it's so horrible. That's why it took the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible said God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That's why Calvary was so horrendous. Because he would keep you out of hell. There's only one name on the face of this earth that can keep you out of hell. It's not Baptist. It's not Methodist. It's not Presbyterian. It's not Catholic. It's not Jew. There's just one name that can keep you out of hell and it's the name of Jesus how many has ever heard of Oliver B. Green Oliver B. Green when he was a little boy there was a wicked man that lived in the town where he lived he said that man came time for him to die and he was laying on his deathbed he said he rose up in bed he'd been in a coma apparently or something for some time but all of a sudden his eyes just popped open wide and he rose up as, as far as he could in that bed and he said can't you see them they're coming they're coming down the sidewalk can't you see them they're coming after me and they said no there's nobody out there and tried to come 
comfort him. Oh, yes, there he is. They're coming for me. And, he, and they said to him, oh, no, 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 you're just, you're, just, you're, just, you're just hallucinating. And then he said, they're coming through the door. They're coming through the door. They're coming to get me. They're coming after me. And he screamed before he died and said, oh, they're dragging me down to hell. I'm going to the pit. I'm burning. And Oliver Green said, those that stood by that bed that time, watched that man die, said it changed their life from then on. They never were the same again to watch a soul die and go to hell. You can cover up your sin to your spouse, to your children, to your parents, to your friends. But buddy, when you go into a service and something opens you up, and I mean opens you up and says, I know everything about everything, and starts naming it, dates, times, places. That's conviction. Because he points you to Christ. Are you listening? Are you listening to me this morning? Are you listening? Some of you are doing things that you would not want these people to know. You certainly would not want your wife or your husband to know. You are doing things that you think you're doing in secret. You're hiding, sneaking around doing it. And my friend, the day will come you and your sin will find you out. You can be certain of this. Your sin will find you you out. It will find you out. God is not mocked. Do you understand the horror that's going to flood your soul the moment you wake up in hell when you realize that there's nothing around you but damnation and sorrow and burning in hell? Can you imagine what that'll be like? There's nobody to plead with. There's nobody to cry out to. There's nobody to go to to get help. You're in hell. To lift up your eyes in hell has got to be the worst shock that could possibly happen to anybody. Not dying. You're going to die. You prepare yourself, some of you, for that. You know you're going to leave here. That's not a shock. The shock is waking up where you don't expect to be. Earth's greatest, finest go to hell. Kings and queens and preachers and popes and nuns and evangelists. The very wealthy, the very poor, the gifted, the privileged, the authors, the musicians, the actors, the athletes, presidents, Supreme Court justices, dictators, murderers, thieves, atheists, agnostics, Christ rejectors all. That's who goes to hell. You don't go to hell because you're rich. You don't go to hell because you're poor. You don't go to hell because you're the president or because you're the Supreme Court justice, a king or a pope. You don't go to hell for that. You go to hell when you reject Christ. That's why you go to hell. It's not about you and me. It's about you and this. It was here before you ever showed up. It'll be here when you're long gone. It was here before your school was ever built. It'll be here when your school is falling in ruins. This is the eternal word of the living God. The issue is not Preacher Lawson. The issue is God's word. What are you going to do with the book? If the Bible didn't exist, I might say, well, you know, every man does the best he can. Follow whatever light you got. If it feels good, do it. We go through life once and live it with gusto. You know, eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. But there's a Bible. If you were living in some pagan dark country out here in the bush somewhere, couldn't read, didn't know zip. But you don't. You got a Bible right here in front of you. Well, preacher, I want to tell you the truth. I've never read it. That's the truth. Most Christians haven't read it. They've never read it through from Genesis to Revelation. The sad state is that in the church today, most people are as ignorant of the Bible as they can be. That's why they can be tossed from one church to the next church, one doctrine to the next doctrine. It's because we are such a flim flam butch, because we don't know anything about God or His Word. It's a sad commentary, but the Bible has not changed. Hell is real. I don't make any difference to me if you're a professor at some college or university in anthropology, archaeology, and what have you. One day we'll all stand before God. It's things like that that people like to pass out of their mind and say, when I preach here, there can't be any real truth to that, for God is a God of love. That's all I hear today. We're supposed to love ourselves and then appreciate the fact that God loves us because He is a God of love. Therefore, that we can live any way we please, we can live any kind of a life we want to, and there is no accountability at the end of our lives. You have believed a lie. 
Somebody has been messing with your mind. Now, what I'm preaching to you this morning about hell is not new. The message you're hearing from this preacher today is not new. This is what has been preached for 2,000 years. You just don't hear much of it today. And the reason you don't is because you live in the age of deception. You live in a time when men want your money. They're not interested in your soul. Because I've heard people say, it's not about money. It's about peace, and it's about joy, and it's about love. It's about money. Do you know why the people on your job really ain't Christians right now? Because you are preaching to them Jesus Christ. People ain't worrying about no blood on no cross. They worrying about how they're going to make it through the day. It's all about the money. It's all about the money. Show me the money. You don't even need an anointing. If you show money, you won't need money. Right now, you need to make a vow of five thousand dollars. A thousand doesn't get your faith going. You could do a thousand. You need to make a vow of five thousand dollars. Money, come up to me now. They don't care whether you whether you die and go to hell or what. It doesn't matter to them one bit. And the reason they don't care whether you go to heaven or hell is because they are going to hell themselves. The pulpits in America are full of wolves in sheep's clothing that do not care for your soul. If a preacher will get up and preach to you like I am this morning, he will warn you, he will tell you that my friend, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. He will tell you the truth. I remember when I was a boy, I used to think about eternity. I used to sit around and think about it forever and ever and ever. And it would always blow my mind. I always try to get something worked out and to figure where it's coming from and where it's going and to analyze it and break it down. But I could never get a hold of eternity. And I still cannot get a hold of eternity. It is beyond human comprehension. But to think that if you die without God and without the Lord Jesus Christ, that you're going to go off into eternity lost without God. Put yourself on that treadmill. What if it was you that were taking your last breath on this earth? What if you were leaving planet earth and you were about to die? My dear friend, you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You have no idea. And yet we live like we're going to live forever. It is this false sense of security that Satan has brainwashed men and women with that causes them not to think about their eternal soul. To die without the Lord Jesus Christ is a horrible, horrible thing. Somebody said, well now preacher, hell is the grave. Is it really? Then my friend, what is this talking about? Psalm 9 verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. That doesn't sound like a grave to me. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 14 says, therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth. You telling me the grave has enlarged itself? This earth has plenty of room for all the dead. Make no mistake about it, the necropolis is being filled up every day that you live. They're carrying caskets out here and they're playing taps or whatever they're doing. Somebody is dying right now while this preacher is preaching this message to you. Somebody is taking their last breath and they'll never breathe again on planet earth. It's over for them and they're either going to heaven or they're going to hell. Now men can hang all the accolades and wards on you they want to. They can brag about you to high heaven, make, uh, make it sound like you're the greatest thing on earth. But when you go out into eternity, there's just one that matters. There's only one that matters. There's just one name across that bar. On the other side of Jordan, there's a name above every name and it's the name of Jesus. If you know him, my friend, you'll go to heaven. If you don't know him, you got no hope. You wind up in the pit. It doesn't matter if you live 150 years. It won't bother hell one bit. It's waiting. It has much patience for it knows that every soul lost without God that departs from this world will enter into its mouth. You say, people, I appreciate you're, you're an alarmist. You're playing on our emotions. You're just, you know, you, 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 you're trying to hype this thing to get me emotionally involved. No, I'm trying to reach you. 
you're jaded. What's that mean, preacher? You've seen so many deaths, seen so much violence on television, hurt so much with your ears, that it's to the point now where it takes a, a sledgehammer to reach inside and get by all of that and get down to where you live and talk to you. I prayed before I got up here this morning, Holy Ghost, I'm the messenger, Lord, but this is your service. Some of these people may hear what they're hearing for the last time on this earth. This may be their last opportunity to ever make it right with God. Now, folks, listen to me. Your friends can go eat with you. Your friends can go play with you. Your family can gather around the table. You can talk, converse, socialize, do all you want to. Everybody have all the friends, this, that, and so forth and so on. But when it comes to the time of crossing over from this world into eternity, you're going to do it alone. Let's talk about something else. It's called the cross. Jesus Christ, now listen carefully, did not die a horrible death on the cross for you to drive a new car. These godless prosperity preachers that spend all their time, all their time, godless as they can be, hear me and hear me well. There's only so much time left in this life and you hear me well. All they talk about is money, 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 money. And they don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the cross, and salvation, and redemption, and the new birth. They know nothing about it. Where are they going, preacher? They're going to hell. They're going to hell, and they'll drag you down with them. I don't care if they're Pentecostal, Baptist, Lutheran, Episcopal. I don't care what they are. If all that preacher that you listen to talks about is money, what did Christ die for? They had money before he ever died. Long before he died. What did he die for then, preacher? He suffered the horror of the cross to keep you out of the horror of hell. I don't want to go to hell, preacher. I don't want to go. Well, I don't either. If you tell me this morning that you don't want to go to hell, you're showing me that you're still in your right mind. That you haven't been brainwashed and duped to the point now where you bought into this lie where everybody's good and everybody's the same and everybody's going to go to heaven. No, they're not. No, they're not. Well, how do I stay out of hell, preacher? There's only one that can keep you out of hell. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That's what Peter said. But the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, why don't you cry out to him today? Why don't you accept him now? Why don't you say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to go to hell. Save me. The motive might not be all that pure, but who you're coming to is pure. Think about that. Don't ever let some religionist hang something over your head and tell you and try to analyze you and break you down spiritually as to why you prayed and this and that. Just remember this. If any man comes unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ today. You come to him this morning. You get up out of that seat and you say, I don't want to lift up my eyes in hell. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want to come down to the end of my life and look off into a dark eternity and not have a clue what lies on the other side. And the closer I get to it, the greater the terror grows. And then when the moment of light, when the moment comes where I cross over, there's something over there waiting on me. Go ask these atheists what's on the other side. I'll tell you something else to ask them. Ask them what life is. They don't have a clue. Yet they're so arrogant and so proud. And they know it all. And we're so stupid to believe in a creator. Yet they could not tell you what life means. The atheists used to be the ones who, who crawled around in the darkness, you know, and they didn't want to. But today, it's, listen to me, let me tell you how what a fool you are for being a Christian. How intellectually deprived you are how stupid you are to believe in God and to believe in the Bible and believe in eternity. Let me show you how smart I am. I listened to an atheist the other day and they said, he's a famous atheist. He wants you to know he's an atheist. He brags about it. His name's all over the internet. Oh, and they ask him now, what happens when you die? Because you're going to die. You know, there's no more of this cross the legs, sit back, cameras, lights, and you're the big name, big shot. When it comes down to the end, it's the end. You're looking at death. What are you going to do if you're wrong and there's a God out there? You know what his answer was? I'm going to ask him which God he is. And he named a few. Thor, 
Zeus, Baal, Mithras, Yahweh? I'm going to ask you. No, you won't. You're fooling yourself. Atheist, if you wake up in eternity and there's a God Almighty out there and you know you're approaching Him, you're not going to bother asking anything. Here's what the Bible says about it. In Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse 31, it says, It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Oh, don't lift up your eye in hell. Don't lift up your eyes in hell. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. That's not about me. Not, don't do it for me. Do it for yourself. Don't lift up your eyes in hell. Because if you do, it's too late. It's too late. Are you ready? Are you ready? Remember, folks, I'm just a messenger. And that's the message that he laid on this messenger's heart two days ago. And I couldn't get it off. I couldn't get away from it. I couldn't change it. I couldn't do a thing about it. But get up here this morning and give it out to you. Now I feel a great burden lifted off of my soul. Before you walk out this door right now, your spirit and soul could leave your body. And where are you going to go when you do leave this body? I want to ask you a question. Where are you going to go? Do you know you're saved today? Do you know your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you know the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed your sins away? Do you know that? Do you know that? Because if you don't know that, you're playing Russian roulette with your life. Did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he went to the Cal cross at Calvary, that when he hung up on that tree, there he was nailed to that cross? What you saw at Calvary was a preview of the sinner's hell. Do you know that? You're looking at a preview of the sinner's hell. What do you mean, preacher? First of all, he was condemned. He was condemned to hang on that tree, and all that go to hell are condemned. Secondly, he was, a, he, was, he was abandoned. He cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All that go to hell will be abandoned. Third, the Bible said he became sin for us who knew no sin. I believe when the sinner goes to hell, it'll be a sin that eats him up for out of eternity. It'll be a sin, breathing it in and breathing it out. What he did, the opportunities to be saved, they'll never leave him. He'll think, my, my, my. Why didn't I walk that? Why didn't I get saved? Why didn't I bow on my knees before God? Did you know, my dear friend, that in hell the name of God, the name of Jesus is everywhere you turn. You never heard such praying in your life as you'll hear in hell. Prayer meetings everywhere you turn, yet it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. It's too late. There is the final abode of the wicked. It is a lake of fire and brimstone. For the murderer facing his victims, there is a judgment. For the abortionist facing all the little babies that he's killed, there is a judgment. For the rapist that's, that's, that's molested these women, there is a judgment. To the drug dealer that's ruined the lives of countless thousands, there is a judgment. No more pleading, no more begging, no more words. Time for words are past and gone. No more opportunities, no more, no more revivals, no more preaching, no more invitations. No more, no more, no more. What preacher can I do? Oh, what can you do? Some Christian, tell them what they can do. Somebody that's been born again today, you tell them what they can do. What must I do, the Philippian jailer said to Paul and Silas. What must I do, he said, to be saved. And Paul answered him and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. There's a reason for you hearing what you're going to hear now. There's a reason for it. And I want you to take, think very seriously about what's being said and about your future. Your days are numbered on this earth. One thing Satan can do to keep you occupied, to keep you preoccupied, to keep your mind constantly on trafficking, buying, selling, living, whatever else that occupies your time and your mind 24-7, he will do that. Make no mistake that he will keep your mind occupied to where you don't think about where you're going when you leave this world. Eternity is forever. You're living a temporal life. You breathe in, you breathe out. Your heart beats and the blood courses through your body. But your body will cease to live 
one of these days. That's something you need to come to grips with today. Some of you live in denial. You think, I'm young and I'll never die. Some of you think, well, medical science will find an answer for whatever problem that I have. So you put off and put off and put off and put off the inevitable, but the inevitable will catch up with you one day. Death has much patience. Make no mistake about that. Inevitably, every one of us will go through that door of death. If the Lord Jesus Christ does not come soon, we will pass, as David said, by the way of all the earth, and your days will come to an end. This is the area that philosophy and psychology and education and so forth wants to leave alone because they don't know anything about it. They can't handle it. It goes beyond them. They have no control over it. They cannot look into eternity. This is where the Bible sets itself apart from every other book on the face of the earth because it speaks with authority clearly and distinctly about what lies beyond the door. Of death. If this were your day of death and it did come your way, and it can come a lot of different ways. You could be shot dead by a robber in a bank. You can be killed in a car wreck on your way home. An aneurysm could explode in your brain and you could bleed to death. Your heart could collapse and you could stop breathing. You could have a stroke or anything of that nature. There are a lot of things that can go wrong with the human body. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here 2,000 years ago, preached more about eternity and hell than anybody that ever walked this earth. That is undeniable. There is no way that you can read the New Testament and deny what the Lord Jesus said. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. You're a logical man or a woman. You're a thinker. You tell me how that you know there is nothing beyond the grave, since we have an abundance of overwhelming evidence that tells us that there is something beyond the grave. For in the medical science today, the ability to resuscitate, and they'll call it out-of-body experiences or near-death experiences, they abound. If you get on the internet and begin to check into medical science, you'll find out that cardiologists that spend their days dealing with people, some of them dropping dead in their very sight, are resuscitating these people. And my, do they have stories to tell. If it was only a story, you might say to yourself, well, you know, anybody can create a story. But how do you explain the fact that these people leave their bodies and can explain in detail what was done to them while they were, while they were supposedly clinically dead? If you died right now, you'd find yourself probably in the greatest shock that you could ever imagine. For some of you do not believe there is a hell. You've been told that when man dies, he dies like a dog. And there's nothing that lies beyond the grave. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible does not try to prove anything to you. It simply makes a statement and declares these things to be. I can look beyond the grave. If you die without the Lord Jesus Christ, you will lift up your eyes, falling in a pit. You will be falling headlong down, down, down into the pit of hell. It'll be the greatest shock that you ever had in your life because you do not believe that it exists. If you think that this life is all there is, you're in for a big surprise. For you will come down to the end of life, some quicker than others. Some only live a few years, some many. But the point is, for it is appointed to men once to die, and you will die. And my friend, that's just the beginning. For the scripture says there is a second death. The second death is the death of the soul. It's the death of the identity. It's the death of the person within the person. It's the death of who you are. It takes you to a place where your identity is gone, where nobody knows who you are or cares who you are. The second death is a place of damnation. It's a place of torment. It's a place of hell. And I want to warn you right now this morning, the Word of God doesn't care, my friend, what kind of religion you have. It doesn't care about your education. It doesn't ask you how much money you've got in the bank. He's not concerned about your friends. He doesn't care what kind of car you drive or clothes you wear. The word of God is clear. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's not my word. I'm simply telling you what the word says. The second death awaits those who know not the Lord Jesus Christ. But let the Son of God himself with his own words tell you what lies beyond the grave. In Luke chapter number 12 and verse number 5, he says this. Luke 12 and verse number 5. 
No more sobering words were ever said on this earth than this. I don't know how you could warn somebody any, any greater than this. Luke chapter number 12 and verse 5. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Have you noticed the wording? That's very important. To die doesn't put you in hell. Note carefully that death and hell are separate. They're two separate things. You can't no man has the power to put you in hell. No being has the power to put you in hell, but he does. He said, I forewarn you whom ye shall fear, that my friend fear him, that after you hath died, hath power to put you in hell. That's what the Lord Jesus just said. He said, yea, I forewarn you. Now my friend, take that warning, would you please? Would you please hear what the Son of God has to say? If you shut your eyes in death in this world, that's one thing. But the Bible says that he has power. He has authority. He has the ability to cast you into hell fire. I don't want to go there. I want you to understand something. You hear me well. I don't want to go there. There's no mitigating circumstances. No courts of appeal. No judges. No judgment. Once you are cast into hell fire, you're in the very presence of the Almighty being judged by him. There is no higher court. There is no appeal for appellate court from that place. You're there and there you'll remain. Are you sure? Are you absolutely certain? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt if your heart stops beating in the next 30 minutes and your body dies where you are going to go? For the Bible said I forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him once you're dead that hath power to cast you into hell. That's a fearful thing. That's the kind of warning that somebody ought to take. And here's how he finishes it. He said, yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now, my friend, if you have, if you have any sense at all about you to understand that you're here and you're going somewhere, you ought to take heartily in your heart that warning. He warned you. The public school system didn't warn you. The government didn't warn you. My friend, the secular society that you live in didn't warn you. They don't know what they're talking about. You understand? They do not know what they're talking about. But this book I have in my hand is the Word of God. And he said, I warn you. Yea, he said, I warn you. Listen to the voice of the Son of God. He said, I warn you. The one that went to the cross and bore your sin in his body. The one whose back they laid open with the cat of nine tails. The one they nailed the nails in his hands and in his feet. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He said, I forewarn you. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore and have the keys of death and hell. I forewarn you. I saw heaven open. Behold a white horse and he that sat upon it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He said, I forewarn you. And the throne of God and of the Lamb become one throne. He said, I warn warn you. There is none greater. In Revelation 1 verse 18, he is called the Almighty. He is God Almighty manifested in flesh. There is none greater. He's God if there is God and there is no greater God than the one that said I forewarn you. Where you going dear friend? You've had a warning. In Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 11, in the latter part of humanity's existence, as it comes down to the end, as it all winds up, he says this in Revelation 20 and verse number 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And the Bible says when this great white throne, when he sits upon the throne, and his visage is, un, is, is open, up for creation to see when they begin to look upon the face of the Almighty. They can't take it. They've got to move. They can't stand before Him. Nothing can stand before Him. He is so holy. His light is so pure. His love is so refined. He is who He is. And nothing can stand before the God that I serve except He be purged. He's got to be cleansed. He's got to be changed. He's got to be saved. 
saved. He made a son of God out of him so you can stand before him one day and you can worship him and take in his glory. Boy, you talk about soaking up something. When you take in the glory of that glorious being that is from everlasting to everlasting and creation can't even stand it. Imagine what he's raised you to. So the Bible said this white throne, they marched before it. Who are you? Will you be there? Will you be at the white throne judgment? Will you be at the place, my friend, where they mock God? They make fun of him. They laugh in his face. They, my friend, do anything they please. They wallow in their iniquity. And they think that they're going to be able to live like that and just die and it's all over with. I'm sorry, you're sadly mistaken. As the bumper sticker said, you better hope there's no God because of the way you're living. My friend, I'm going to tell you something right now. You'd better hope there is no God if you're living like hell itself. But I'm going to tell you this morning, there is. There is. There is. That biology textbook that's nothing but a piece of garbage that's based upon the premise of evolution, which is nothing in the world more than a bunch of old wives' fables, cannot be proven in a laboratory, cannot be demonstrated. My friend, the theory, and that's exactly what it is, an unprovable theory that is called a theory of evolution, becomes the hallmark, the faith, the foundation of infidels and those who deny that there is a judgment hereafter. It is so much easier for them to believe in a non script thing in something that has no reality and basis and they can believe in something where there is no judgment in the future and so there's no reason in life and there's no purpose in existence other than what you make out of it and that's what they want to pump into the brains and minds of kids that go to school today but I'm going to tell you what lies beyond the grave no man can tell you what's there but God can there is a place that is so horrible that the human mind cannot conceive it. But it was not conceived by the human mind. It was originated in the word of the living God. It was made for the devil and his angels. And you will be in for a surprise. For you will lift up your eyes in hell. This preacher is trying to warn you this morning what lies beyond the grave. And it will be a day of shock like you've never known in your life. It will be hard for you to take it in. You'll probably believe that it's all a dream, that somewhere along the line that you're going to wake up and it'll all be over with. But you'll find yourself continuing to fall into hell. Deeper and deeper and deeper you'll go into the pit of the condemned. The Bible calls it the bottomless pit and into hell you'll go. It is a place of reality. You cannot deny its existence because you're there. You would want to tell folks on this earth where you are, especially those that you care for and that you love. You'd want them to understand that you're in hell, that all that they believe about hell is a lie, that their, that their liberal religion has lied to them, their preachers have lied to them, their science has lied to them, that they believed a lie all of their life because you're in hell and you want them to know about it, but you can't tell them because they have the living word of the living God. And into hell you go. If the rich man could be brought up this morning and I could stand him here on this stage before you and give him five minutes to preach, you'd never heard a message in your life like you'd hear from him. He'd let you know in unknown certain terms that hell is a place of fire. Hell is a place of loneliness. Hell is a place of burning. Hell is a place of sorrow. Hell is a place of despair. Hell is a place of lostness. There is no other place on this planet like hell. Into the heart of it he falls and it begs you and, and plead with you if at all possible please accept the Lord Jesus. Please repent of your sin. Please get right with God now while you can. While the day is near. While the hour is right. While you can be saved. The rich man had begged you. Plead with you. He'd do anything he could for you to keep you out of hell. In Luke chapter number 16, he said, Sin, Lazarus, I've got five brethren. I don't want them to come into this place. They're going to see me here. They're going to ask me why I didn't warn them. I'm going to have to spend eternity with my five brethren in hell. He's been there 2,000 years. If he could just have one moment of peace, just a little moment of peace, just a second or two away from the flames, he'd beg for it. Oh, what he'd do. But he has none. 
It's night and day, 24-7. His mind must endure it. He knows, being a human being, that there's a tomorrow and another tomorrow and another tomorrow. He knows there's no end to his suffering, and that is suffering itself. Just to know that there will never be a time when hell will turn him loose. He is in a horrible place. Horror like horror has never been known. Let the horror of knowing that you're going to burn forever flood through your soul. Let the horror to know that you're in a dark pit and you'll never have relief from that. That is hell enough for you and hell enough for anyone. And without the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll go to hell. He's been fallen for 2,000 years. Many have been fallen for 2,000 years. They've been screaming. They've been begging. They've been crying. And my friend, they can't do a thing to get out of hell. What a place it is. The Bible says in Luke chapter number 16, it's a place of torment. And torment he is, tormented, night and day, night and day, night and day, said preacher. What a horrible thought that somebody would go to hell. Was that somebody you, dear friend? Are you sitting here this morning listening to me, fully cockeyed, convinced in your mind that you're good enough never to go to hell, but the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that can keep you out of hell. The Bible said there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I can understand why. They wail because of where they are. They gnash their teeth one against another and fire engulfs them. They breathe fire. They live in fire. Fire embraces them and they scream night and day. The sounds of hell must be horrible. Imagine all the souls are in the pit. There must be a horrible sound if you could pull back the gates of hell this morning and hear what's going on. You wouldn't want to hear it. You wouldn't want to hear that kind of crying. You wouldn't want to hear the loathsome scream that comes up out of hell. It rises way deep down inside a pit where men and women know they have no hope. In a place where the dying die and never live. A place where the second death begins to take its toll on the human soul. Dying and never completely dead. Dissolving and never completely dissolved. Hell, my friend, is what the Bible says in Luke chapter number 16. The rich man died and went to hell. There was a hell at the cross. There was hell in the nails. There was hell in that cat of nine tails that ripped his back open. It was hell for him to hang there for six hours on the tree. But he did it for you. He did it for me. He suffered my hell. Glory to God to keep me out of hell. And I bless the name today of the only one who could conquer hell. There's one that has power over hell. There's one whose word hell listens to. There is one that can shake the very foundations of all creation. And that's the name of Jesus. I know that name. I know that man. I'll never have to go to hell because I know him. I'll never burn, thank God, for the Lamb. Bless the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. In hell he burns and continues to fall when hope is gone. Nothing but despair floods the soul. He burns and he burns and he screams. And those about him scream. And those about him burn. I cannot imagine. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. All I can do is just try to preach to you and paint you some kind of a picture to give you an idea of what this horrible place is like. I want you to know that the fear of God is not before any man today. Men and women today live like there is no God. There is no judgment. There is no hereafter. There is no accountability. They do as they please. They murder as they please. They have sex as they please. They kill babies as they please. They live like they are themselves a law unto themselves. And the day will come when they'll find out that there is a God Almighty. Hallelujah. There is a Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the name. There is one greater than us who is the judge of us, who is the king of the universe, and his name is Jesus. If hell tried to take hold of me right now, if hell tried to grasp my soul, if hell tried to reach up and say, I'm taking you into the pit, I'd put my hand out and I'd say, no, in the name of Jesus, I've been to the cross, I've had the blood, I've been saved. 
saved. I've been washed in the blood. I cannot go to hell. Hell would have to recede. It would have to say, yes, that's true. Hell would have to acknowledge the power of the Word of God. I'll lay my head on my bed at night. I can sleep in peace. For if I don't wake up in this world, I know, I know, I know, I know, I will not wake up in hell. Amen. Hell ever enlarges itself. It is never satisfied. It's like a giant squid that reaches out and pulls into its midst all it can. Its mouth is agape and open and wide it receives. All that would reject the Lord Jesus Christ are going into hell. Lost without God and without hope and falling into hell. What a sensation it must be to be falling head over heels. Down, down, down you go. And you fall headlong into hell. You scream, you beg. And my friend, it doesn't do any good because you're in hell. Hell hath enlarged itself. It's wrapped its arms around you. It's pulling you into its midst. Down you go further away from God into damnation itself. And there's nothing you can do. You are in the pit. You're in a place called hell. And your mind goes back to what you might have said on this earth at the times you've heard the gospel and been the preacher begged you to get saved and you rejected him the memory in hell must be horrible torment the thirst must be horrible it must be terrible to burn night and day 24 hours a day seven days a week and you say there is no hell to your surprise you'll find it out firsthand Hell is populated by demons. It's populated by fallen angels. It's populated by people, by the tens of thousands, yea, even millions. And you continue to fall. You won't be alone. There'll be many around you. But there's no comfort from all those about you because you're in hell. Hell is a place of torment. It's a place of sorrow. It's a place of suffering. It's the end of a Christ-rejecting life. It's waiting for every last human being on this earth if Christ has not borne them into the family of God. It's a place of horror. Abraham said, son, remember. And my friend, you will remember. You'll remember this message that you're hearing right now. You'll remember the messages that you heard in any other church, any other preacher, a faithful man of God that tried to warn you about hell. You'll never forget that message. Your memory will be as clear then as it has ever been. For it'll be the thing that haunts you throughout eternity. And that is the life that you lived on this earth. And you continue to fall. That memory will eat at your soul. It'll lead at your heart. It'll lead at your very being. It reminds you over and over and over again of the opportunities that you had to be born again. And you refused them, rejected them. You had plenty of time, you say. I'm going to live forever. I feel like I'll be here forever. And that's the average person. But you won't live forever. There is a destiny waiting every last one of us. There is a door we go through. There is a time you breathe your last. There comes a time when your heart beats its last. That is a reality that you've got to deal with. And when you leave this world, where, dear friend, are you going? The Lord Jesus Christ said, don't fear him that can destroy the body. He said, yea, I forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him that hath power not only to destroy the body, but to cast you into hell. And that, my friend, is in the hands of the living God. The Bible said it's a terrible thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God. And that's exactly where you fall when you leave this world without the Lord. The Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. It is the fire of holiness that consumes in hell fire. It burns nothing to burn it up. It doesn't need anything to burn as we understand. It is that burning flame that consumes and consumes and consumes and burns and burns and burns forever. The screams that rise up from hell, the Bible Bible said is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You think you won't, but you will. The time will come when you'll wail and weep and gnash your teeth. Don't let that happen to you. You can stop it now. You could do something about it this very moment. For the Lord Jesus Christ suffered your hell at Calvary to keep you out of there. And that that I just said to you will ring through your soul throughout eternity if you go to hell. The Bible said weeping and wailing 
and gnashing of teeth and you continue to fall deeper and deeper and deeper you go into the bottomless pit the horrors rise up beside you the sound and the screams and the smell and the fire all encompasses you because you're dropping down into the land of the condemned they that enter in have no hope there is no hope in hell there are no children in hell there is no peace in hell there my friend is no mercy in hell there my friend is no grace in hell but hell is a place of torment and damnation oh I didn't write the Bible I didn't say a word about it God didn't consult with me this book was written before I was ever conceived and hell fire was there before I ever came into this world the Bible said hell was not made for man it was made for the devil and his angels and you continue to fall deeper and deeper and deeper into condemnation condemnation is a process from the moment that you're born in this world till you take your last breath you're going down a path either that path leads to Christ or that path leads to hell and the day will come when life ends and you'll find out one way or the other where you're going I am so thankful to God today for the blood of Jesus Christ God's son that cleanses from all sin for I know whom I have believed I know that I'll not go to hell thank God for that today but do you know that do you know that do you know that you say I don't know what lies beyond the grave then you're a fool to play Russian roulette with your soul for I guarantee you one thing you're going to die and what awaits you beyond the grave friend is horror without imagination the Bible calls it a bottomless pit and you continue to fall down you go deeper and deeper into the clutches of condemnation into the clutches of despair when your own heart and your soul one day will remember and come to the realization that you'll never have a place to go to you'll never get out of there you're condemned in hell fire and damnation forever you're in a land of sorrow a land of condemnation think about what I'm saying to you there's a reality of where you're going when you leave this world either you're you're going to the Lord God and you're going into the land that is fairer than day and by faith we can see it afar or you're going to hell fire you're going to the pit you're going to the land of the damned you're going where there's no hope you're going to condemnation you're going to hell and so my friend when that day comes you'll scream you'll beg there's praying in hell you better believe it there's crying in hell every imagination of a human mind all the emotions that make us what we are rise up out of hell but there's no one down to help and no one there cares no one next to you screaming this one's screaming you're screaming and you're in hell you say preacher why would such a thing happen to a human being it's when you reject the Lord Jesus Christ you refuse the sacrifice that was made for you where there at Calvary God the Lord the Son of God took your hell into his body on the tree and we deny him and we reject him every single day of our lives and by doing so write our own death warrant thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift all that God requires of you at this moment his Lord Jesus be merciful to me a sinner why wouldn't you get up out of your seat why wouldn't you get on your knees why wouldn't you cry out to him for mercy you say hell is a horrible torment yes but the way of salvation is the free gift of God and you can accept that or reject that and that's the choice you make and the day will come when those that are in hell falling deeper and deeper headlong into the pit will hear a voice it'll be a voice unlike any voice they've ever heard it'll be a voice that reaches to the lowest hell it'll be a voice that shakes the very foundation of the pit itself and it'll hear a voice that stops the fall It'll hear a voice that shakes hell. It'll hear a voice that hell responds to. It hears the voice of the maker, the master, the creator, the lord of the universe. And hell itself begins to rise. Higher it comes, up to the surface, 
all for a fleeting moment. The soul has been burning for a thousand years. May have one moment a thought of respite. Possibly I can be forgiven. Maybe God has changed his mind. Oh, maybe an opportunity. I'll repent. Oh, Jesus, I'd repent. I'll repent, Jesus. But it's too late. Hell has marched before him. And there you stand with the smoke and the torment and the condemnation all over your being. You've been a reality that you wish a thousand times you could just cease to exist. But you've got to be brought before the great white throne judgment of Almighty God. In the distance he sees a throne. What is that, he says to himself. It's a great white throne. It's huge. The whole universe points to that throne. As a matter of fact, there is nothing but the throne. He looks above him, there's nothing. He looks beneath him, there's nothing. He looks about him, there's nothing. As he realizes for the first time in all of his existence, it's all about God and him alone. No big names here. No, I, no identities here. Nobody to brag here. It all comes down to the maker and his creation. One by one, they march before the throne. One by one, the books are opened. And another book is opened, which is the book of life. And every name that is not found written in that book of life will hear a voice say to him, depart from me. You cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And at that moment, the choice is no more. No more pleading, no more begging, no more words. Time for words are past and gone. No more opportunities, no more, no more revivals, no more preaching, no more invitations. No more, no more, no more. And something takes hold of you that's more powerful than you. And as it drags you away, you hear the roar, and it's a roar unlike any you've ever heard before. You've been in the hell, you've been in the fire, you've watched the sides fly up by you, you've smelled the stench, you've tasted corruption, you've been covered with vileness, but now you're being led away to a roar, a roar like you've never known until you approach it and now you begin to understand there is something worse. There is something that hell itself is going to be cast into. There is that final judgment for the murderer facing his victims. There is a judgment for the abortionist facing all the little babies that he's killed. There is a judgment for the rapist that's, that's, that's molested these women. There is a judgment to the drug dealer that's ruined the lives of countless thousands. There is a judgment. You hear it, now you smell it, now you see it. They take hold of you and they cast you physically alive, as alive as you can be, condemned into a lake burning with fire and brimstone. That is your final abode. There you will burn forever and ever. Hell itself, as horrible as it is, is headed to the lake of fire and brimstone. That means you will be cast kicking and screaming and begging into the lake of fire and brimstone. And when you sink into that lake, it is your eternal abode. The Bible said, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, it says that the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever into the lake of fire and brimstone. And then from the minds of all that ever knew you, all that ever loved you, God will wipe your very memory from their mind. For those in heaven will not have to sorrow over you. It'll be, it'll be as though you never existed. And the Bible says the memory of the wicked shall rot and you'll be done for. I didn't give you a Hollywood script. I didn't read from somebody's romantic book. I didn't tell you about what some religion teaches. I gave you the words of the Son of God who died on a cross 2,000 years ago that you could be saved to keep you out of hell. There is the final abode of the wicked. It is a lake of fire and brimstone. Would you just hear me for a moment?
Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. You don't have to go there. What preacher can I do? Oh, what can you do? Some Christian, tell them what they can do. Somebody that's been born again today, you tell them what they can do. What must I do? The Philippian jailer said to Paul and Silas. What must I do, he said, to be saved? And Paul answered him and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. What would you say to someone to keep them out of hell? They came to you and said, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to hell. What would you say to them? Would you say to keep the commandments, do the, live a good life, be good to people, you know, do the best you can? That's not going to keep you out of hell. There's only one that can keep you out of hell. It's a man. His name. Jesus. Why don't you get up today and come down here and Say, preacher, I want to sing about Jesus, and I want it coming from my heart, and I want to mean it. I want to sing about him because I love him. I love him. Uh, he's just not a fire escape. I love him. I want to sing about Jesus because he's been good to me. <laughs> yeah, he has. I want to sing about Jesus because he's my Lord. I want to sing about Jesus because he's worthy. That's the main message of Revelation 4 and 5. He's worthy. You could come down here and lay your hand on that Holy Bible and say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Lord Jesus, keep me out of hell. And you've come to the right one. That's why he went to the cross to keep you out of hell. How many more times do you have to be warned? How many more opportunities are you going to be given? How many more services are you going to sit through and harden your heart and stubborn your, and stiffen, stiffen your neck to the truth of the Word of God? It's not this preacher that judges you. I am not capable or qualified. I don't have the right to. But it is this book that already has judged you. Won't you come out now? Get down on your knees and say, Lord Jesus, there's a lot of things I don't understand, but I don't want to go to hell. Yeah. If you'd come to him with an honest heart, a sincere desire to not go to the pit, he'll stop it. 